Welcome to uh, the second part of the MVVM uh, tutorial. Um, today I will talk about one interface. Um, it's called iNotify Property Change and it's very, very important for MVVM and WPF. And um, I'm <coughs> I will show you how what, what this interface is all about and how you use it. And I will show you a tool um, which makes the work with the work with this interface much more easier for you. Okay, so let's start. Um, I first um, I added one project to our solution from um, the second of the last tutorial, the UI test console, and I will use this um, little console application. It's just a console application, nothing more. I will use it to show you the basics of iNotify property change. Um, and then afterwards, I will add some uh, notify property change logic to our WPF MVVM application. Okay, so let's start by examining this interface. And I will use the object browser to examine this. And I just want to I notify property changed. I just search for this interface. And as you can see, it is one of the most uh, easy to understand interfaces because it just says that every type that implements this interface must provide one event called property changed and this event is of the delegate type property change event handler event handler and this one is just uh, a normal event handler as um, as a node and that's it that's all about this interface and I notify property change is used to um, uh, add a functionality to types when you implement it that says, hey, when some property in this type changes, I will inform um, any type of other code that is interested in changes on this property. So, and um, first of all, I will show you how you implement it, and then I will show you how you use it as a caller. So let's start up by adding a simple class. Let's call it test class. And I just make it public. And all I do is I implement I notify property changed. And as I do it, my Visual Studio says, hey, you, you, know, you are lying because you're not implementing I notify property changed. So I will do it, I will implement it. And this is a behavior which is not normal. It comes from reshuffle, a tool which I use. I just if you do it uh, on your machine and you uh, don't have reshuffle, it's just this. You just say, hey, I implement I notify property change because I provide um, an event which is called property change and which is um, of type property change event handler. When you do this, you can build. This is valid code. So this is boring right now, uh, and now I'm prepared a little bit. Um, and let's say we will use something like this. This is uh, a structure called auto property. And now we have a problem because in the case of um, auto properties, I cannot um, implement it correctly. Property uh, I notify property change because. What I want to do is when the setter is called and when the property value changes, I want to, to raise this event to each caller who is interested in. So what I do, and you have to see me typing a little bit, I will create a protected method. Actually, just let's use reshuffle because it does a good job. So I just use reshuffle to create this protected virtual method, which in fact just raises the property change event if, and this is the null propagation here, the new one, if it is not null, which means at least one uh, part of code is interested in the property change event of this instance. Kind of confusing, but it's just a simple event, nothing more. Now, let's implement a member variable 
and call it some property. And now just refactor this a little bit. Where is it? And just say uh, refactor and encapsulate field. Okay, this is a resharper dialog again. This might be some somehow different on your machine. I don't want to use auto property. I want read and write usages. Okay, do it. And that's this stuff is coming from this refactoring. So what I do now normally is if value, the new value, equals some property, then do nothing. Because somebody wants to override this property with the value it already has. That's no change. And now I want to propagate the event. And I just call on property changed. And as you can see, this method normally wants this property name to be passed in. And we don't have to do this. We actually can't do it because of this attribute caller member name. This, had, this has nothing to do with uh, I notified property changed. It's simple. It's an attribute which is uh, declared on a property, on a um, parameter, sorry. And this says when this method is called, the name of the caller, in, in our case, same property, is propagated as this value. That's all. If you don't know this, um, it's there since I don't know how many um, .NET Framework uh, or C Sharp releases and it's working. You don't have to call it like this, name of some property, for instance. It's not, it's possible, but in fact, I, I, I told you a little bit uh, stupid stuff. It's possible to do this, but it's uh, senseless because it's already done for you. So we just can do it this way. Okay, now what we have is we have a property which when the value changes will fire the event property changed. Let's test it. I'll go to the program and I just prepared a tiny method. Let's paste it in. Oh. Now <clears throat> what we do here is we are creating an instance of our test class and we are interested and in, we're hooking in to the event property changed and we are saying okay whenever the property change event is raised just write to the console the following and then um, we will change the properties and we will change it first to hello world and we expect here expect it to fire the event do not fire event. Why? Because we are not changing the value. It's the same string as it was. So it should, shouldn't come here. And here, hello world again, should fire. So now we want to test it out. Just property change and the console read key. Just see if it works. <coughs> so this is the result. And as you can see, we are changing it to hello world and we are getting hello world as the new value. And then we're changing it back to hello world or again to hello world and nothing happens here. And then hello world again will lead to a new message, which means, okay, that works. Okay, so now when we look at this uh, class, we recognize that this is fairly a bunch of code for a tiny little um, functionality, which means if we want to implement this in more um, uh, in our productive productive classes, you can imagine how much uh, lines of code you will produce when you will implement I notify property change the right way. We won't do this. So what we want to uh, do instead, we just want to use auto properties. Let's say some property again, that's it. And we want to get rid of this one. This is our class, that's it. We want to see it this way. And to achieve this, we can um, implement or bring in uh, another technology. Uh, and this technology in our case is named 4D property changed. 
This is just one possibility to do this and I like it, so I will show you the way. So no, um, property changed is a package from new, NuGet. You can get it here when you just search for property changed. And you can see it here, it's this one, property change.foldy. And in fact, this is um, something, just let me see if I have it. Um, Oh, I want to browse for it. Uh, we'll, we'll come later to this one. For the property changed. And you can see here there's a GitHub uh, project for this or repository. And here it's open source and you can take a look at it. And it, it, is, it is a module which is part of the Foldy project from Simon Crop. And uh, what it does, uh, technically I will install it. Install it. Uh, meanwhile, what it does is, uh, in the moment, the compiler wants to build intermediate language out of our c -sharp code. This one hooks into this process before the intermediate language is built and will add something for us. In, in our case, it will search for iNotify property changed implementers and it will detect them automatically and then hook into the properties. Um, this is nothing <coughs> which is unusual to .NET because you have to keep in mind that this syntactic sugar called auto property, which I use here, in fact already creates a real property in intermediate language. There is nothing like an auto property in the .NET common language runtime when it runs in the inter intermediate language. Uh, it's just C sharp um, uh, syntax. So Foldy does nothing more than detecting this, um, searching for all properties inside of iNotify property change types and doing something with, it, with them. And we will take a look at this. So now we added the NuGet package and there's a file, Foldy Weavers XML. And this file has this entry, which means, hey, Foldy, please activate the Weaver property changed. That's it. It's just switching property change on and off. So now I just did nothing than removing this bunch of source code and adding this package and see what happens when I press play again. It's still working. Think about it for a second because it's working, but here there's no code propagating this event. So how can we uh, see this in action? We can do this by going to the output folder, open folder, then debug, because I built it in debug. And here's my exe file. And now we will come to this tool, which you could see um, from the website screenshot um, a few minutes ago. This is jetbrains.peak, it's cost free. You can download it and um, this one, um, when you started this tool, you can take any .NET assembly, um, an EXA and DLL, whatever, and just drag and drop it into this uh, program. And we'll, uh, this program will examine the DLLs and will detect all the namespaces in this case and the types. Here's our test class. And now you can right click it and go to decompile sources. And you, take, you can take a look a few seconds of what happened with your source code, with your c -sharp, um, before it was built to intermediate language. And as you can see, here's our property. And this property has now a getter. It's not an auto property anymore. It's got a getter. And it's got a setter and see what happened. Fody just injected this code. Uh, don't mix this with uh, things like code generation, like Entity Framework, which uses T4, the 6th uh, six version of Entity Framework, or um, with things like Roslyn, <coughs> the new .NET compiler platform. You can generate code with them, but this code is visible to you inside of Visual Studio. What we did here is the code, in fact, isn't visible and you don't have to mess around with it and uh, write unit tests for it or things like that. 
It's just code which is generated automatically when you hit a F5 or when you build. That's it. So this is the purpose of uh, Foley and uh, especially property changed. This enables us to just concentrate on our business logic, which is good. Let me zoom in a little bit. I always forget this. So what it does, um, it, it does even more for us. So let's imagine we will introduce a calculated property. Let's say, it's not that sensible, but let's say we would have a property which is called, just a second, I have it here. Let's say we will introduce this one. So this is a calculated property which will uh, return the length of the string inside of this property. So it has to change all the time when this property changes. So what happens now when we have Fody in place, when we hit play? The cool thing about Fody is it detects automatically that when we change the sum property here, and the sum property gets the hello uh, world, um, or no, the length of sum property has changed before this, and then the sum property changes. This is a bug which I created, in fact, because I just always um, put in this. Let's correct this a little bit because it's a little confusing. So let's do it this way. And now it's correct. The output is correct. Okay, he's saying, when I, when I change this, when I reach this line, he's saying, hey, first of all, the length of the property has changed. And then the value of the sum property has changed. How does this work? So back to this tool, dot p. Just close this one, go to decompiled sources. And now you can see here is a new line because Fody has detected that there's a dependency between those two properties. And he automatically injects in the setter of this property uh, a hint saying that, hey, you have to uh, fire the event for this property too, because it depends on me. That's very cool. You can, in fact, um, use some attributes coming from Fody. I'll show you this too. Um, actually coming from property change, not from body. See here, here's property changed. It's coming before because we have a reference here to a DLL, which comes from with the NuGet package. And when I just take a look at it, you can see that inside the property change namespace, there are a bunch of attributes. You can, for example, do this one, depends on, name of, some property. And now you say it explicitly that this property depends on this property. This is useful in some cases where this Fody automa automatic mechanism isn't working. You have more complicated examples where it can't auto detect um, those dependencies and then you can give him hints. What you can do too is you can say, hey, if this property changes, do not notify on property changed. And this is the thing which I just deleted a few minutes ago. So when the sum secret property changes, nothing should happen. So when we hit play, you can see here, sum secret property never changes. When I take away this hint here, Then it changes some secret property. So you have full control over the code generation of uh, property changed. Um, I use it in my real projects and it's working very well. So this is the basic concept of I notify property changed. It's a simple interface just to sum it up. It's a simple interface and you can, it's uh, saying nothing more than um, a type which is implementing me um, can. Uh, promote events if values of properties are changing and if you use Fody property changed and with together with those types it'll all be automatically automatically created for you so when we bring this together to our WPF MVVM project
let's do this for our startup project. How can we use this? So let's just implement property changed in this project, in our logic. So here's property changed. Just install this package here too. This is the place where my models, my view models, in fact, are um, everything from the first part of the tutorial. So now we go to the properties and let, just add a simple property and just say this is a progress property. So it indicates the progress, simple as that. So now <coughs> we will just build this. And we will do a binding in our view. So I go to the main view uh, window, to the main window. I just say, I am taking my first control. Let's say I use a progress bar. So progress bar will be a very big one. Let's see if it would be corrected. But the main thing about this is we will bind the value of the progress bar against the progress and where comes programs progress for just for recapitulation progress is a property in the main property of the locator and the main property of the locator in fact is a main view model instance so we can bind the progress against this how can we test this we can say in the constructor if we are in design mode hey let's do the following let's say progress is 30. Let's build this. Building is very important here. And now you can see how binding works in WPF. Um, this is the technology. Binding is a technology which is the base of MVVM because just because there are bindings and another thing called commands, we will come to this later on, because something like this exists in the core of WPF. MVVM is possible, is implementable. And this is because um, the properties, in, in this case, the value property of the progress bar, isn't simple in int. In fact, it, it is a, a thing called dependency property, which means it's a property which also has some logic, um, in, for instance, logic for uh, which um, searches for I notify property changed and knows what to do with I notify property changed. For example, hooking into the property changed event and reacting on it. So how can we test this? This is design mode. So let's do something when uh, things uh, start up. So here we have our main view model and let's do a dirty trick when we are not in design mode. So what I do is I will delay for let's say two seconds and then I will continue this is a task from the delay by doing the following I will um, increase the progress by five waiting then for let's say 500 uh, milliseconds waiting for this I don't use uh, as in stuff like that. I don't know if this is working. I, sh sh I think it should do. And now let's see what happens here. Oh, uh, in fact, maybe we get a crash. Let's see if we get a crash. This would be a good thing too. So now, uh, I stopped this. Uh, now I it's something very stupid. <laughs> My progress less than 100. I have to do it some more times. And now I just don't touch it. Still free and so on. No crash, but mm, sadly not. So, as you can see, we are not changing anything. On the UI layer, uh, just to show you, here is no code included to change the value of the progress bar. It's in fact for people which are 
used to uh, go to Windows Forms or classic WPF, you need a name for the progress bar for getting a hook um, from the code behind to manip manipulate it. We don't need this here. Uh, all we do is we go to the main view model, which is nothing more than a, a class which in inherits from something, some class, and we are changing a value in a class in a different assembly. And magically, because of dependency properties and bindings here, this value changes on the UI. What we should do is we should do this in a single task. Let's see if I get it to crash. It's my favorite kind of task. So I run the task and let's see if it crashes. I want it to crash. Oh, I hate it. It doesn't crash. Okay, um, what I'm waiting here for? I'm just waiting for <coughs> an exception which will come in place because what we're doing here is we are creating a task, a new one, and this task is changing the progress. And this means that the binding will get this change um, because of the iNotify property changed and will try to manipulate the UI from a different thread, which is not allowed in WPF2. So the safer variant of doing this one is something like, um, let's see, uh, I am dispatcher, dispatcher helper. This dispatcher helper is interesting because it comes from view model base, which in turn comes from MVVM Lite. Dispatcher helper has um, a thing like Dispatcher helper. Then run as a look. Sorry, I had to uh, cheat a little. Dispatcher helper run as a look. It was correct. Now do this one. And what this will do is it will use a dispatcher. It's something which is in um, window base of um, WPF already there and the dispatcher just looks at the thread which wants to do something and just brings the logic, in fact this action, and executes it on the UI thread, on the main thread in fact, not the UI thread. And that's, that's, that's it. <coughs> Sorry, this is what dispatcher helper is for. So let's just try if this one works still. Now, um, it is not working. Ah, yeah, I know, because I forgot, forgot to initialize it. Now it should work. A little bit confusing, um, but now it works. And this should be the more uh, clean way to manipulate it. Okay, it's working fine like it. <clears throat> so um, now we have this in place and let's examine our UI in this tool which I showed you. Just uh, go to logic UI and just find the folder, go to the bin folder, to the debug folder and now I will open up my .peak and I just will put, where is it in fact? Scalarsoft, oh, I see, rebuild, go to this folder again, and it should be, ah, here it is, just overlooked it. This is my DLL, which I just created, and now just take a look at the main view model and decompile this. So now in our main view model, you can see the Windows title is just raising property changed Windows title. This is happening again because we are implemented FODI. And now the, our progress all also raises property changed because we implemented FODI. And if we change this progress, we are raising the event. What happens then is that um, thankfully WPF um, or 
exactly the dependency property, detects this property changed event and knows, hey, something changed. So you have to request the new progress value from this instance where the value changed. And then we have to refresh um, our UI. And that's it. Uh, that's why I showed you I notified property changed because it is so simple. A lot of people don't um, you know, take it serious enough, I think. And it's a very, very basic component of MVVM. <clears throat> in the next part, I will take a look at, um, on another interface, which is called iData Error Info, which is very, very useful too. And then we will come to more sophisticated examples, which means we are leaving the basics, but this was very, very important in the first place. Remember Fodi, uh, remember I know if property changed and um, see you next time. Bye.